Ah, you need to unmute, love. I'm trying to unmute. Let me undo the go. mute. How's that? <laughs> Thank you. And good morning. Oh, what a pleasure it is for me to be your guest speaker this Sunday. And thank you so much, Reverend Kathleen, for providing me this opportunity. And I know that you watching are already enjoying this service. I saw something on Facebook not too long ago that I think describes it perfectly for you. There's no parking. You can attend service in your pajamas. You can refill your cup of coffee anytime. And best of all, you can mute me at your option. Now, for the past month, the theme has been honoring the divine feminine in all. Since the divine feminine is a concept grounded in spirituality, its definitions can vary depending on who it is you ask. Now, Suzanne Kingsbury, who is the author and founder of Gateless Writings, provides the insight that there is so much more to explore. For she explains that the divine feminine is an aspect of self associated with creation, intuition, community, sensuality, and collaboration. You know, so many times people confuse the divine feminine and the divine masculine with gender. You know, we all agree that humans have a gender identity, which is basically the individual conviction or self-awareness that they are either male or female. And so as a result, from that human perspective, we have a tendency to believe that God, spirit, must also be a gender. Now, I'll be quite honest. Uh, I believed growing up in my early childhood years that, that God was a boy. In fact, I got to tell you, in my very early years of childhood, I probably couldn't have told you much difference between God and Santa Claus. I mean, I figured they had to be closely related, at least first cousins or so. I mean, take a look at it from my girl childhood perspective. They were both male. Both Santa Claus and God were male. They were both white. I never saw any other picture of Santa or God where they weren't Caucasian. They both had blue eyes. I never saw them with brown or any other color of eyes. They both had a list and they checked it twice, trying to determine who was naughty or nice. And by the way, they both had consequences and rewards depending on which list you fell. No, about the only thing I probably could have told you back then regarding the difference between Santa Claus and God is that every picture I ever saw of Santa, Santa always had a full beard. Whereas pictures I'd seen of God, whether it be in a book or in a domed cathedral ceiling or on a mural on the wall, uh, sometimes God had a beard and sometimes God did not. So the only thing I could probably have told you is that it was obvious. Sometimes God enjoyed a really good close shave on occasion. You know, when it comes to gender, we can find a variety of perspectives. However, many of us here that are watching were raised in one of the Abrahamic faiths. Now, the Abrahamic faith. Hey, you. Hey, you. One of the Abrahamic faiths are those uh, three religions that face their that encounter their that, that do their biblical roots back to the same father of Abraham. And so as a result, we call them the Abrahamic faith. And so that would be in order, uh, Judaism. Christianity, Islam. And when we start to realize that these three faiths comprise collectively almost 50% of the world's approximate 8 billion population, it's easy to understand why there is this prevailing belief that God is a male, that God has that gender of being a boy. 
However, did you know that at one point in time, thousands and thousands of years ago, long before even the tribes of, of the Hebrews got together, that goddesses reigned over the gods, that priestesses reigned over the priest. Now, there were a number of reasons for this, but there were two that were considered extremely mystical. One, the first is sometimes the most obvious, which was women gave birth. Women created, and therefore women were the creators. The second reason was equally as mystical, and that was that every month women could bleed four, five, six days straight, and they did not die. In fact, there are some scholars who theorize that this is where blood cutting ritual became part of religious ceremonies as men tried to emulate this feminine quality, this mystical quality of themselves. So what happened to the power of the goddesses? How did the powers of the goddesses become so diminished? Well, I'll share with you, Dr. May Sinclair, who wrote the book, Infamous Eve, A History, which is a great book for it provides what was occurring politically, socially, and economically during this time up to present day, provides some fascinating information. You see, back then, we are aware that there were 3,000 gods and goddesses that we are aware of between all the different tribes, all the different regions, all the different kingdoms throughout this entire area, everyone having their own gods and goddesses. We are aware that there were at least 3,000 gods and goddesses. But back then, no one went to war over religion. You know, that's more of a, of a recent concept in mankind's history. No, people went to war for the old fashioned reasons. You know, they went to war because of greed. They wanted each other's land, or maybe they wanted their gold or their riches, or perhaps it was as, uh, or water, or perhaps it was old fashioned as retaliation, revenge. You hurt me, so I'm now going to attack and hurt you. Now, what was interesting, however, is that as the conquerors came in and established their rule, they would look at the power of the gods and goddesses of the people that they had just uh, uh, taken rule over. And when they realized that there was a quality or power of those gods and goddesses that theirs did not have, they would actually steal that power and they would then give it to their own god or goddess. Now, what's interesting about that is that when they took the power of the goddess, many, many times, more times than not, they would actually give it to one of their gods until eventually we ended up with this belief that there's only one god. It's a boy god, but it's a boy god who gives birth. And you don't think we didn't steal at least one quality from the goddesses on that? You know, it was the fourth century Bishop Augustine who stated, if you have understood, what you have understood is not God. God transcends gender. God is spirit and has no form. Perhaps one of the most remarkable things ever written about God in the Hebrew Bible is found in Exodus 3. When Moses goes up to the deity and asks its name, and in verse 14, the deity replies, I am who I am, which is merely a mixture of to be verbs in the Hebrew language with absolutely no reference to gender. If anything, Exodus is extremely clear that God is simply being, that God is spirit. In the Bible, in the book of John and in Corinthians, it states that God is spirit, not material. To paraphrase the teachings of Jesus to Nicodemus, it states that we can see the workings of spirit, but we cannot see the spirit itself. 
you know, one of the things I've enjoyed in my decades is I have studied the Bible, and I mean going back centuries through all the different writings and translations and the edits and the redactions and the edits and the substitutions and the deletions and the re-re-editing and the re-re-editing and the re-translation and how even changing uh, a simple letter can change it from masculine to feminine to neuter. One thing that I was absolutely fascinated to learn was that the gospel writers were extremely careful to note that Jesus never used the masculine term anir, which means male, when it comes to self-description. Instead, Jesus always used the word anthropos, which means human. If we go back to the beginning of the Bible in Genesis, in chapter one of Genesis, it states that women and men were created in imigo dio, the image of God, which suggests that God transcends all socially constructed notions of gender. In the oracles of the 8th century prophet Isaiah, God is described as a woman in labor and a mother comforting her children. In the book of Kings, it refers that God had a wife, a Shira, whom was worshipped alongside Yahweh in his temple in Israel. In fact, Raphael Pate was the first historian to mention that Yahweh was worshipped with Asherah by the ancient Israelites in his temple. Asherah, known across the ancient Near East by so many other names, whether it be Astart or Istar, Asherah a mighty deity of power, of being nurturing. And the book of Proverbs maintains that the feminine figure of holy wisdom, Sophia, was assisted God during the creation of the world. Indeed, the church fathers and mothers understood Sophia to be the Logos, the word of God. And the Jewish rabbis associated the Torah, the law of God, with Sophia, meaning that the feminine wisdom was with that spirit since the beginning of time. Is it okay to call God mother? Absolutely. Not only is it okay, it's probably long overdue. For now is the time that we can break this conspiracy of silence regarding the feminine face of God. We see the divine feminine and the divine masculine beyond gender. It, we see the divine feminine as the givingness of spirit to see itself. We understand that the divine feminine and the divine masculine are principles that are operating within each and every one of us, regardless of gender. Gender. You know, there are actually more than two genders. Wikipedia identifies five. Although in our society, the genders that are most recognized are male and female, known as the gender binary and are usually based on one's anatomy, you know, the parts that you were born with. But were you aware that not too long ago, Facebook introduced dozens of options for users to identify their gender? Now, it used to be that you could only identify your gender as either male or female, but now there is a custom gender option. And though this Social media giant will not disclose or has not disclosed a comprehensive list. We are able to identify 58 so far to date. And that includes odd gender, bi gender, androgynous, non binary, trans female, trans male, and two spirit. Because there are an infinite number of ways to express spirit and to experience humanity 
Absolutely, each person is unique in expressing that face of God. The feminist theologian, Mary Daly, asked this question. Why must we think of God as a noun? Why not a verb, the most dynamic and active of all? You know, I love that question. I love contemplating that question. Rather than thinking of spirit as a noun or referring to spirit as a pronoun, to think of a God as a verb. To recognize that God, life, that energy is our own true nature of being. In fact, here's kind of a fun thought. What if we are nature's verb of itself? The divine nature of the feminine being receiving, trusting, faith, loving acceptance, faith. The divine masculine the power of energy, of courage, the power and abstract. The symbol for the feminine is receptive. The symbol for the masculine is penetrating. Adam Foley, a master yogi, states this. The divine masculine and the divine feminine long for union. The masculine witnesses the universe. The feminine is the universe. We hold both of these yin and yang energy within us, regardless of biology or gender. Let us move out of these boxes created by human label and recognize that each and every one of us as human beings are spirit expressing. You are the face of God. See that divinity within you. And as you recognize that divinity within you, look and see that face of God, that divinity within each and every person, regardless of gender. Loving, laughing, giving, sharing. And as you do, embrace that divinity. For what you are seeing is the divine embodiment of spirit itself. As Ernest Holmes once wrote, the spirit can know nothing outside itself. It is the center and the circumference of everything that exists. It has no enemies, no differences, no otherness, no apartness, no separation from itself. It is undivided complete and perfect within itself. It has no opposites and no oppositions. It knows only of its own ability to do. And since it is all, it cannot be hindered in any way, shape, or manner. It is not possible to conceive of such a complete life and power. But we do catch glimpses of it in moments of real inspiration, when we realize to a degree at least that God is all. The allness of God. Yes, we are able to catch glimpses of it, aren't we? Through so many different ways and through so many different practices, whether it be through prayer or through meditation. It could be through walking through Mother Nature and, and seeing the beauty of, of, of the sun rising over the mountains or seeing the buds burst forward into bloom. It can be through music. There are so many different ways that we are able to connect with that oneness, that allness of where it is, of who we are. Although I must confess, so many times I feel like that little boy in the cartoon who was walking home, and as he entered the door, his mother greeted him and asked the question, well, what did you learn in school today? And the little boy replied, not enough. They want me to come back tomorrow. And so it is for us.
that we too continue to come back to that one source, to that allness of God, as we learn, as we grow, as we expand our consciousness into knowing our oneness with all that is, as we recognize our relationship with spirit. You know, it has been said of God, my names are many and my forms are endless. So what is your preference on how you see God? Do you see God as a father or as a mother? Do you refer to that spirit as he or she or it? Do you think of God as a noun or a pronoun? Or perhaps do you think of God as a verb? You know, the beauty is, it doesn't make any difference for no matter what word you use that connects you, that resonates within you to that oneness, to that field of energy that we know as spirit, that divine feminine and that divine masculine presence of those qualities, those principles. It is absolutely perfect. It truly is your choice, and it's good. For myself, I embrace it all as I honor that divine nature, that divine presence of light and love that is within you. And so with that, let us go ahead and go into prayer, knowing that allness of God Knowing that there is only one life, knowing that there is only one presence, that that allness of God is filled with love, with joy, with, with beauty, those divine feminine aspects, knowing that God is power, that God, that courage of God is there, the divine masculine knowing that each and every one of us are imbued with those qualities of spirit, that we too are God's beloved child. And so as a result, as God's beloved expression, we are imbued, we are infused with those qualities. I know that each and every one of us here is that divine expression, that divine embodiment of spirit itself that each of us walk boldly, for each of us is a divine force of good in this universe. And I know that we are an authorized divine force for good in this universe because we exist right here, right now, in this physical plane of existence. That our time is now, shining our light, shining that goodness that is within us knowing that spirit is always guiding us to our highest good, directing it, that that infinite wisdom, that infinite intelligence, which is part of our divine nature, is letting itself be known. I claim right now that that radiant center within each and every one of us is shining brightly, that we are reflecting the magnificence of God, that we are the glory of God in physical form. And in this moment of today's time, that glory of God is being reflected through the hands, through the technicians, through every single person on this planet. As we help, as we recognize, as we share those divine feminine qualities of givingness, of love. Love. That beautiful, beautiful aspect of which we are. For there is no separation, there is no apartness from God and from all that God gives, and we are its space. How grateful I am knowing this truth, knowing that not only all of God is with you, but all of God is for you. How absolutely joyous it is knowing this truth knowing that this time is now in every moment that we breathe. We and God, we and spirit are one. And so knowing this truth, I am so grateful. I am so thankful. I open my heart with joy in receiving it. And I let go and I let God to take over. And I anchor that in that knowingness by saying 
And so it is. So it is.